You good? Yep. So we are the red state. You get the free suntan as well. Let's turn this on. All right, so welcome to our talk. Uh, my name is Johanny, and this is my colleague Pierre. Yep, I'm Pierre Luigi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> uh, we work for a company called Snap Mobile in Germany. Uh, neither of us are Germans, but uh, I think this is the most international talk here because I'm Finnish, he's Italian, and we live in Germany and we speak in English, right? <laughs> um, anyways, we want to talk about scalable stuff and beyond smartphone screens. Uh, but we're going to be talking about responsive design and basically what responsive design is, just so we talk about same language, is to making sure that the user experience is best on every possible device, any screen size and so on. But I also prepared to convince you why it matters again. Um, compared to iOS, um, so this is iPhone. Let's see. Okay, the pointer doesn't really work. On that side is iPhone, on this one is Android. Um, this is two applications that neither of them are optimized on the platform at all. And iPhone, you get the iOS iPhone 4 stretch up in a tablet. On Android, you already have a little bit better design. So Facebook hasn't optimized the Instagram at all. Who knows the per <coughs> person in the picture? <laughs> So, but in short, um, we as Android developers, we've been building responsive and different screen sizes for a long time. So, iOS has been just a few. Remember back when they laughed at us because we couldn't build pixel perfect screens and now they can't. Um, we've been building this one, but web developers have been way ahead of us for a long time. They've been building our every possible screen size because web you can scale screens. However, what happened, um, I think we can all agree that Google kind of gave up on tablets. How many of us have an Android tablet? How many of us actually use it? Free, I get free. Um, but what happened was Google moved towards Chromebooks. How many of us has a Chromebook? Nobody, two, three, okay. Well, this is not a surprise. They are very US-centric with the Chromebook tactics, but I hope I can explain um, why it still matters here. Um, for example, now if you go to the Pixel C website on Google Play, or whatever it's called, Google Store, it will redirect you to the Pixel Book Store, if it's available in your country, which is one in, a, in Europe. But if we look at some statistics, um, this is the only bar chart thing, uh, only consultancy thing uh, today, so don't worry about it. Um, on the left side, the bottom bar, okay, it's too bright. Um, the bottom one, you see the market share in US in educational sector of Chromebooks. They, in last year, end of last year, they are about 60% of all educational devices are Chromebooks that are sold in the US. Um, in rest of the world, it's different. But Apple is losing the battle here for sure, so iPad is not the solution. What is going to happen is Chromebooks. And because Google now supports Android applications on Chromebooks, in practice, uh, Chromebooks are now the new tablets. And we don't have the same chicken and egg problem that we had before, which was that nobody had Android tablets, so why would I build? for Android tablets, and why would I buy an Android tablet? Because nobody builds for Android tablets. But now we have Chromebooks that are massively popular, and all of them, all of them run Android applications now. So we had this picture, but we're going to be this now. Um, right now, you can drop something on a Chromebook, and what will happen, users can resize the screen to any size they want. And now you have to build for infinite screen resolutions. You can't pick small couple of screens anymore. So this, I, this is just a prefix. I hope this is, helps you to understand why this matters again, because I've been talking about this for years and years and years. Um, and some could argue because of death of tablets, it doesn't matter anymore. I argue it matters now more than ever. Yep. Thanks. So yeah, actually, 
when we are talking about scalable UI, there are quite a different aspect to be considered. Uh, the experience, it's different on different resolutions and different devices. Uh, for example, if we take something like uh, finger or cursor uh, on desktop devices, the keyboard experience is different. Uh, if you are filling up different forms, of course, uh, if we have a physical keyboard or a digital keyboard, it matters. Uh, push notifications, geolocation, SMS verification, for example, if we are doing it on a desktop, might not be uh, available, while on mobile, yes, and so on. But actually, what we are going, so this is a, a, a big topic uh, due to kind of time restriction today, we are going to focus mostly on the UI part, so how to build a uh, proper layout for different screen and uh, resolution sizes. So let's start from uh, some basic principle uh, or design principles, let's say. Um, one of the most important is the, user, the usage of the space and in uh, specifically of the empty space. So, ooh, okay. So what happened? Uh, we have uh, our mobile first layout. We want to scale it up. Uh, how do we handle with the usage of, the, of a bigger space, of bigger resolutions? So the most straightforward thought would be, OK, we have more space, so we can uh, show more content. If we take it as an example, for example, the, um, when the me uh, Windows Metro Grid actually came up, uh, it was a very good uh, approach to easily flex. Uh, it was flexible enough to scale it uh, across different devices, but it was scaling quite good. For example, uh, for mobile, tablet, um, maybe seven, ten inches, and so on. But if we just take this one and apply it to something like a 27 inches, uh, it might be not the, the the best solution. Let's say, so. What happened is that in these cases, we have to consider the usage of the empty space. Uh, as it, it, it is as much important as the, let's say, the field space. So we don't have to fear it. There is actually um, uh, an, an, uh, an expression, let's say, for the fear of the empty space, which is horror vacui. This has been uh, used uh, in, in the art history for uh, several times. For example, in the Middle Age, all the artists were uh, were filling up the whole canvas because they had the fear of, of leaving even an inch of, of empty space. We know nowadays, thanks to the Bauhaus school, uh, uh, who, who brought, him, uh, uh, brought in um, the principle um, of the minimalism, who fought against uh, the decorations, that actually um, it, uh, there are some good principles. One, one of the most famous one is, of course, from uh, Miss van der Rohe, which is less is more. Um, and we know that uh, this has been tested. So for example, uh, there was an interesting test about shop windows, uh, which said that uh, the more elements uh, we are showing or there were were shown in a shop window, um, the less was the value perceived uh, for each of those elements. Uh, and of course, the more the horror vacui and um, uh, the less the value. So this has been tested across different users. Of course, we don't have to uh, take those principles too seriously. Otherwise, we end up with uh, people might be hurt, hurted. Or, uh, uh, so let's say we, we have to make sure that we don't take this minimalism to the extreme. Um, another, another principle which is also quite important is the cognitive overload, which is uh, stayed pretty good by the Higgs law which says basically that uh, the more options are presented to the user and uh, more, the more the time um, to take an action actually will, will increase. In this case, for example, we, let's say we can simplify saying that uh, if the horror vacui was less is more, in this case, less is fast. So if we take an example, for example, uh, a TV app, uh, this is already a specific use case because the user might be in the mood in which he wants to be relaxed. Uh, he doesn't want to actively look for content, be overloaded. So maybe in this case, for example, presenting a navigation of three different layers uh, plus different layers of content might not be the best solution. 
if we take, for example, the next Netflix example, uh, they are doing pretty good job in a way that they are using different logics to present uh, the content to the user and kind of anticipate his needs. Uh, for example, by presenting uh, the last um, uh, the last shows, uh, the what is better for you, the trending now, and so on. So this way, the user, for example, can choose easily the the, the content itself, and this effort is eased out. Another important uh, principle to take into in consideration is is the visual weight. So the visual weight basically affects the, the forces or the eye forces uh, that attract the, the user on a specific layout. So if we start, let's say, from a very blank layout, we can see that there are already some natural forces which runs across this layout, which are centered and uh, across the from corner to corner. Those forces um, meet together in the, in the optical center. And this is the, the strongest natural place that attracts the eye of the user. There are also some uh, secondary uh, focal points, which reside basically from the center to the corner. And um, using these uh, natural places or, op or focal points, um, using them, we can somehow reinforce uh, or placing, for example, action or title uh, the way uh, we want uh, the user, uh, the user's eye, to to be attracted on a specific canvas. Of course, uh, the eye moves. There are uh, specific uh, visual directions uh, or reading patterns. Let's say this is one is the Z patterns that uh, runs from the primary optical area, uh, top left, uh, to the bottom right, uh, to the, the terminal area. There are also other types of patterns, like the F patterns. So usually in text-heavy uh, layouts, the user scans vertically and then analyze horizontally the, the type of, context, uh, of content. Um, so yeah, but how do we actually balance the elements uh, in a layout? There are actually different values that we can tweak. Um, so, for example, we know that uh, warmer colors attract the eye more than uh, coldest colors. So, for example, a, a red button would attract the eye more than a blue button. Larger elements more than uh, are heavier than uh, uh, smaller elements, and so on. So, we can tweak somehow these attributes uh, to to push the user attention when we want, where we want. Of course, uh, we have really to take care when we speak about scalable layout of the width. So what happens, for example, on, uh, on this example? We can see that it's quite balanced. We have the product in the middle, which attracts the, the attention. Uh, we have two elements on both sides, which b balance somehow the layout, background images that go f uh, full screen. But what happened? The, 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 f the, um, the maximal width that is not being controlled. So the user would need to go from the very far left, where he chose the product, to the very far right, where there is the call to action shop now. And this is actually a big distance from the, from the, focal, uh, from the optical center, which is in the middle, in this case. Uh, if we take a very similar layout, I'm not saying with this that uh, you should buy Adidas instead of Nike, it's just a random example. But um, we can see that even though the, the background image it goes from the on the whole screen, uh, the content is it's actually centered. So the call to action, the main content, it's very close to the to the optical center of the screen. This is even more important with text-heavy uh, pages. Uh, if we take Wikipedia, we are looking at it maybe every day or very often. Uh, we can see that uh, it's very useful, of course, but the reading e experience, uh, it's not the best that we can find out there. So there was a time which I was constantly zooming in for, uh, for reading Wikipedia pages. Um, but the problem here is that, for example, one of the problem uh, it's the, the length of the, of the text itself, of the line. There is, for example, a Chrome extension uh, that renders Wikipedia pages in a more readable view. This is an example of the exactly same page. Uh, and we can see that the, the line uh, width is being controlled. Uh, the, the, the line height, the, the leading is, is increased. And uh, the reading, actually, it's easier in this case. Another example could be um, 
um, medium where the layout is in this case is centered and uh, it's even shorter the, the line uh, of the text. So if we want somehow a benchmark, we can say that it's good for larger screen to fix the width and to have maximum around 60 characters uh, per line for a good reading experience. So but where do we start actually? We know somehow now basic principles principles, um, but where do we start in building scalable uh, layouts? So let's start from the breakpoint. So uh, to decide when we want to have different layouts for different resolutions. So if we look at the guidelines, material guidelines, uh, there are some suggestions. Uh, they say that, for example, for smaller screen up to uh, 600 dp, uh, we should use one single view more than 600 dp we can use for example split view or different views and over uh, 1600 we should actually fix the width and center or left align our layout so but if we start from even before from the design point of view uh, what we can do in sketch there is actually a quite or good tool um, it's native and uh, it allows you to basically fix or anchor uh, different elements, fix or not the width and the height, and then you can see basically how the layout uh, can react when you basically try to play around and scale the, the artboard itself, so how your element will stay aligned and so on. Uh, we can even uh, check, for example, if we select in this case a tablet 7 inches, how the layout will scale or uh, if we uh, change the orientation to, to landscape, for example. But actually, this is good, but it's not enough. So it means that, for example, if I would need to build um, uh, or test all the range of Android resolution, it's going to be already difficult to do it in Sketch. So usually what we do with UANI together is this is kind of it's a um, screen taken from a previous uh, talk. It illustrates a bit the process we work with uh, or we we used to work with. Um, so we try to keep the um, development and the, de the design in uh, some somehow parallel bar binaries. And we have close interaction as soon as we proceed from uh, the very broad idea to the um, more specific UI. Um, so what we start to do at one point is to exchange builds, uh, even though it's a, it's the, concept, so the concept is still very rough. And then we start to, to play around and say, OK, on this device, we feel like uh, this layout doesn't feel um, any more uh, good. So let's play around with the breakpoints live somehow. Yeah, we did the last year a talk. We didn't do it here, unfortunately. But there's a couple of recordings online, Freudcon UK and so on, about this slide for whole talk. Yep. So Let's check some responsive patterns. Uh, the guidelines, again, helps a lot, uh, help a lot in this case. We have somehow some basic pattern that we can look at and use. The first one is reveal. So usually it happens that, of course, uh, we have to cut out uh, or he hide uh, some elements in smaller uh, screens, like, for example, could be uh, navigation in this case that could be somehow revealed on larger layout. We have more space here. So this is an example of a project we work together on. Uh, it's a football application that delivers uh, scores and football news. This is, for example, a screen where we have the different matches. And uh, we can see that on the phone, Actually, we had the match day hidden in a drop down. So it's always the current match day, but to switch match day, you would need to tap on the drop down. Again, it's an hidden view. What we, we decided to do is to use kind of two thirds of the space in this, in this um, land landscape view tablet um, for the matches, and one third, for example, to show directly the match day. So you would switch match day with a single tap without having it hidden. Another pattern is transform. So transform, uh, it's used quite a lot because, for example, if we take the example of the list view and we split it up in a card view, we can uh, we are more flexible. So we can better use the, for example, the horizontal space. While the the list view, it's quite uh, vertically um, focused. So 
again, in, in this example, we can see that uh, on the left side, so in the, um, in the list, we show around, I think, seven, eight um, teams. This is a, the, just a team list. While on the, on the card, we can basically use better the, this space and showing much more than that. Other um, pattern, divide. Again, uh, usually on the phone, we have, for example, list view, we enter a detail view. What we can do on larger layout is to show both, so meaning that you don't have to go back uh, from a detail view to a list view, but you can, for example, in the case of a um, new stream, uh, have directly switch directly between different articles while you are focusing on the detail of that article itself. Reflow can be used uh, when you don't find your right pattern. This is a bit more custom. Uh, and you can play around with the um, hierarchy of the elements. So for example, here we, what we did, we decided to kind of break down the tabs on the phone and to show directly uh, the different tabs on the on larger layout. Um, we weren't happy with the solution of having, again, one tab and uh, basically empty space uh, around. It was a bit too much, so what we decided is that let's have a kind of panorama view and see how it feels. So we are in the, in the match context here, and you can have a look at the match itself. Position, it's basically moving uh, position of the elements uh, across, again, uh, larger layouts. What we did in this case, for example, we had the vertical list, again, for, uh, for matches, and we had this um, kind of C-table um, uh, button to jump on the, on the table page. Of course, if we break down the list to the card view, we have to somehow reposition the, the button. So what we decide to do is to have it, for example, aligned with the, align with the title itself. Let's say expand is the last one, or it could be also the first one. So if we don't use any of the previous layout, at least we should fix uh, the width. So what happens? In this case, for example, we cannot break it down to uh, cards because it's a, it's a table view standing. So we need this kind of uh, vertical hierarchy. So what we did uh, is to fix the width. It's kind of very minimal uh, approach, but it works. And it's better than going or split the content across the whole width. All right. Um, so. Then when we start building this stuff, um, I think almost all of these patterns, uh, anyone here can build. And we don't need to really go to details, explain exactly how to build those, because that would be boring. Um, but we were looking into Chromebooks specifically. Um, so what happens when you put an Android application in a Chromebook? Um, on Android, on, on Chromebook, like any other, um, browser, you can, you can resize it by dragging. So that means that this behavior happens on Chromebook that never, ever happens on our phones, unless you use the split screen. But that's even a little bit different. Um, but as an Android developer, you can see when you're resizing this application that's not being customized for Chromebook anyway, but it works. Um, you're going to see that sometimes when I drag it a little bit, it doesn't quite fire the activity again. Sometimes it seems to relaunch the activity. But all of your responsiveness works out of the box. So different styles are being taken on. So when you resize the screen on Chromebook, it's basically the same as rotating. But it just happens in much, much smaller steps. So if you write your application the <coughs> right way, you're kind of already halfway there. Um, to me, the right way means that you think, think about scalability from the get-go. I find it very, very difficult to retrofit scalability in your applications. If you design for a perfect iPhone screen or just a small screen, going to a big screen might be very, very difficult. Think about it. It doesn't mean that you have to build it, because if you go to your product owner or product managers and try to say, OK, I need to spend three more months before we can launch so I can put it on the Chromebook that nobody owns, that's going to be a problem. But think about it. Think about how it's going to be. And then it's going to be much easier later on when you're going to do. Um, read the documentation. Android was built for this one. So it's not coincidence that these applications work really well on the Chromebooks, because this is what Google designed it for. Um, 
and stop locking your device orientation. Like, do not lock it to portrait with one asterisk. Um, sometimes an app doesn't make sense in landscape. Still, during development, keep it unlocked so you see how the creation of the activity works. So you don't have crash, you don't lose state, all of this thing works perfectly. And then one day before you launch, lock it to portrait and launch it portrait locked. But during development, keep it in one. But so, on, in Chromebook, you now have this resizing thing. So we've started thinking, could we do something better? Um, so Pierre came up with this design. Um, great. Uh, now my challenge was to try to make this work on Android. Um, it would have been difficult before, but now it's possible. However, um, if you just do the normal one, um, kind of works. Doesn't really look like the design one. Oops. It works. Um, some developers would argue that's perfect, but I don't. Um, but we now have new tools that make things easy. Constraint layout, amazing new tool that we have because it flattens the hierarchy of the thing. It's sometimes a bit wonky, so it's, you know, it's not very specific, but it's worth learning. Second big thing that happened is architecture components. Um, to me, I think this is the best thing that happened to Android since Android launched. We finally have tools to handle these difficult problems that we have. And this allows us to do what Pierre designed. Uh, you see the final product is not quite there, but the principle is there, and I'm gonna show some code and examples, and you might be able to improve it. But in short, the way to get it this working is to build an architecture based on the live data and view models. Uh, how many of you have used the Android architecture components already? Okay, about half, half. So for rest, uh, that's a good reading for tonight. Um, however, there's gonna be some code. Uh, I try to explain the code. You don't try to, you don't need to me uh, memorize the code. There's a Git repo you can actually look at after this one. Anyway, the important part, live data and view model. Um, just in short, so that we all on the same page, view model, um, the Google architecture view model is not quite the view model we used to. It means a little bit different thing. Uh, sometimes it's the same, sometimes it's different. But in short, it's an it's a object that lives, outlives the activity lifecycle. That manages to use. So you can have a permanent object that is managed by the platform that outlives rotations and recreation of, of things. Live data is an easy way to create observables. When things change, you get fired events. It's like having a event bus or Rx-ish uh, approach. So here's uh, my really, really simple view model. This is, the, this is the core of the implementation that I'm thinking about. And I literally, I store one variable into my live data. So I create a view model that stores how many columns I have on the screen. That's it. Um, then I started thinking about the UI. I started creating um, views. So this is not dynamic but it's an example of idea. This is a proof of concept level of things, okay? I created a constraint layout of one column, two column, and three column. These are all the same. The important thing here is that the IDs of the views are the same, and the, the layout is structured uh, flat. Um, I then, because I want to ma utilize the Android scalable uh, resource management, I created a little bit helpers for me. You can do this easier, but I thought this will be more example, easier to follow example. So I created the three uh, um, helpers that only contain one uh, variable in them. So basically, I will use the Android way to figure out how many columns I should have on the view. I could use, do this directly with the layouts, but I chose to do it this way. Then, um, in the activity, the important thing again, now I just get the view model that is tied to this activity, and I observe changes in this, uh, how many columns I have, and I call animate. Um, this could be cut in half um, if we wanted to optimize, but I think this is easier to follow. Um, this is the method that actually runs the transition. Um, 
it first has something in the force that makes sure that I don't run it if I don't need it, just do not waste time. Then I check what is the value, how many columns I should have, and I map it to my layouts. This part I could optimize and get it directly with the layouts. And the last two lines are only things you need to know. Um, I just tell the Android system that it'll go to this one and this one, and let I don't have to worry about it, let you worry about it. Um, the very last thing, this is also in the activity on create. Um, this is used with the uh, KTX, so once the layout is complete, with a small delay, um, I check, you know, what should be the current number of columns, and I update my live data in my view model. That's it. It's not perfect, it doesn't save ship incorrectly, um, but the idea is there. And what is happening here is that I have a view model that outlives my activity that gets recreated. And because I do it with a small delay, once the new activity is created, it checks how many columns I should have, and it re-renders the layout. Uh, with constraint um, layout, you can do it really easily. You can also use this constraint set animation. Um, I don't remember who wrote about it, but there's another there's a way to do the same thing. The, um, the important part of this whole thing is that you have to have a way to understand what your state was before. You have to know what the new state should be and find a way to animate between them. And all of these tools we have, live data, view model, constraint layout, allows us to do it fairly easily. If we want to push this a bit further, we could also animate them into card like it was in the design. It's on my, I've been too busy to do it, but I, I think it can be done. Um, I'm open to push, uh, pull request if you guys want to do it. Here's the URL for the, for the repo. Um, if you want to take it, uh, snap a picture or come, come to me afterwards and I have it. Um, I promise to improve it. Uh, the current version is not quite there yet. Anyways, that's, that's pretty much what we have to say, uh, built responsively. Um, and thank you. Thanks.